Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a walkthrough of tutorial three and kind of how to approach this assignment. I've realized that there were some issues with my previous video, um, so I just want to re-record it for uh, anyone who might look at that. Uh, so the first thing you want to do, this is in student view here, you want to take a look at the assignments page here, and you want to take a look at the in our case now it's uh, tutorial three so we want to click on this and take a look at this the first thing you want to do is really read through all of this material I do mention that you can install QJS so if you click on this link it will take you to these installers um, the, the difference here uh, between QGS and OSGO4W and the standalone installer is that the QGS and OSGO4W Geo4 work um, is you can do its one download to, to do a lot of development work and other things for very advanced geospatial analysts and developers. Um, for us, you know, you can just install the standalone installer and that's okay. You can, if you have a Mac, you can download the installer here. Um, if you have Linux or BSD or even your, your tablets uh, on, on Android tablets, you can, you can access that. So, um, so this is QJS and how to download it. If I wanted to say download for Windows, I could just click on this 64-bit installer. Most of your computers will be 64-bit. If it's quite old, it could be 32-bit, um, and so that could be uh, that. That could be the only time you run into that problem. So once you've downloaded QJS, like so, you'll just want to click on the installer. Um, so it will bring you to a new page. You'll just click Save File. It will thank you for downloading, and then you'll want to double click to install. So now we have QJS, and remember QJS is optional. Everything here that you need to do uh, is, is provided in this assignment page. Um, the first thing you should do is read all the questions. Um, optionally, if you go under module, modules, you can see we have scroll down you can see we have a video walkthrough which I'll replace tutorial 2 how to install QJS tutorial 2 data and QJS tutorial intro so what I'm going to do <coughs> I'm going to open up this and download it save the file I'm going to go back to modules scroll down Uh, go to tutorial to data, download it, and then go back to modules. And let's see, do I need the anything else? Nope. Yeah, so this should be good. If I wanted, I could download these other things. So I could download the PowerPoints and things like that. But let's, um, I'm just going to use Control J to bring up my downloads. So in the first uh, data, the data folder, um, and so in Windows, I can either right click um, and go to Extract All, and just extract here. I can also, if I want, do the same for this one. I can also use the, the tab up here and just click Extract All. They do the exact same thing. Personally, I like to use a freeware program called 7-Zip. Uh, um, so I've installed that and I like to use this one. But um, but but this one works always in Windows. On a, on a Mac, you'll just double click. So I have a bunch of QJS resources um, if you need help. For Mac users installing QJS, um, it used to be harder. You used to have to use a, a private um, uh, installer, but QJS has integrated that, so they have their own installer as well. Um, so now we have this data. So if we look in here, we have Flint data. And inside, we have all these files. And these are something called shape files. Um, so we'll, we'll know we'll want to work with these. And so now we can all open up QJS. And I've actually already done this just by typing QJS and clicking on QJS Desktop. Now you'll note that I have a couple different versions installed, and you'll actually see both QJS Desktop and QJS Desktop with Grass appear. 
Um, and don't worry about that. You can just click on QJS Desktop. If you've clicked on the other one, it won't hurt anything. And this will appear. You'll see QJS. So what, what I want you to do is just click on New, the little uh, blank page here. That will open up a new project. Now this is a complex program. I really, really love QJS. I have a couple different, um, uh, so you might see a little more icons on my screen. That's just because I have more extensions installed. Um, so if you want to access your files, what you have to do is go to your C drive. So for me, I've, I've downloaded them to my downloads. I can either drag this over. I could actually drag this over and drop it in layers, this little box here and it will ask me to select a coordinate reference system. <clears throat> now at first you might be confused as to what the coordinate reference system is um, and, and whether this is correct. Now it's, it's saying that recently I used WGS84 um, and actually in this walkthrough that we have if I go to modules um, it, it talks a little bit about uh, the um, projection system and, and this is why the QJS part is optional right um, so if I click OK I can see select these vector layers to add I'll select them all and here we go I've now added my layers I might want to change this red color personally it's a little bright I'm going to double click on the red box here I will open up the um, default layer properties. I'm going to click on Symbology. I'm then going to under Symbology, click on Simple Fill, and then change the fill color. And in my case, I want like a like a gray. All right, that, that's a little bit better for the background. Um, I'm going to drag up this. Uh, river here, Flint uh, River. I'm going to go into symbology again, click on simple line, go down to color, and I want to change the color of the line. I'd like it to be a nice blue, so I'll select that blue. I also want it to be a little thicker, so I'm going to increase the stroke width. Click apply, take a look, looks great. So now I have this formatted correctly. This is my demographic data. I also have sampling data. Now if I pull up sampling data, I can see that I haven't I don't have sampling data for all of the areas here. So that's my first thing that I see. A couple missing wards in Flint that might be of concern. Uh, so especially when we're missing data, this is always a critical thing. So if I go back to tutorial three, um, let's read through this whole thing together. So we want to know if there's any relationship between the features. And in, in GIS, as we mentioned during, I think it was class three, uh, features are just the, the elements of each shapefile. So each one of these boxes is a feature. Um, the features with high lead concentrations in the Flint River, based on what you have read about the lead contamination issue, was your response to assignment one justified? So first, we have to look at the actual values, um, the, the spread of the values for each uh, for each um, it within our sampling data. So I'm going to double click on sampling data. So just like this, click, click, and you see it'll pop up. And then I want to uh, symbolize by this value. So if I go to graduated, you'll see that um, this this box appears. And what I can do is I can choose a column. So in my case, I'm going to choose draw one. And then what I need to do is I need to press classify. Because as you see, we have to break our continuous data up into classes. These are like bins when you make a histogram. You could choose a lot of different um, ways to classify data. And if you watch this video, we actually talk about different classifications. So Ash here, a colleague of mine, talks about different applications and, and how you can choose different uh, ones. And so let's say we um, 
we want it to do this. We want to create a copy of quantile label and rename it as equal interval. So the first thing we're going to do, we are going to um, copy this layer. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to duplicate layer. I've now duplicated this layer. I can double click and what I can do is I can re, re, um, reformat this. So we're still using draw one, but we want to change to maybe say a different one, right? So quantile was the other one I wanted to look at. So what I can do, I can change from equal interval here to quantile. Click apply. And so as I, if I were to turn off this one and turn on this one, now I can, um, just by clicking this checkbox to show and hide them, you can see that the, um, the, this is the, let me actually rename it. So that renaming part's always important. So let me, I'm just gonna check to see, I think this is the quantile. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so I'm going to uh, rename it and just call this quantile. So you can see that it's it's very easy to um, uh, du duplicate layers and compare them. So you can see that the distribution between quantile, this one, and sampling data, this one, is very different, right? It, it either can magnify or um, under-report the problem, depending on how we break these. And, and different classification methods are useful at different times, so it's very important to consider how we're classifying the data and what that how that visualizes the data. Um, so, um, which classification method do you trust more and why? You could look at the statistical basis for each of these methods. Now, remember, this is just for your review. The part below is not graded. You're not required to do this part. I just want to show you what it looks like. So one of the things that we do discuss is, do you think proximity to the river affects the sampled light concentration based on your maps? Why or why not? So, uh, well, right now we can see this is the sampled light concentration. So if we look at um, the equal interval and then quantile, you can make a judgment call as to whether you think that proximity to this river impacts uh, the the, the flow uh, or the, the concentration of lead in Flint. Now the question you'd want to ask yourself along with looking at this map is what is the mechanism? What is the public health or the driving mechanism uh, that, could, that could be the source of lead? Is there one? So you have to decide um, on that answer. So you can also use this, uh, this map here um, this map is also available under files. If you want to go there, you can go to files, modules. Uh, I think it's, nope. You'd think I would have it memorized by now, but I do not. Uh, yeah, so I, I, th I think it's also under modules. I think I placed it there. Yeah, I think it's actually under the data. I'll make sure to place a, a copy of that if, that image there if you'd like to see it and zoom in. Um, you can also use that image though. So if you zoom in here, I'll just quickly do it. You can see that uh, the, these very strong red areas are uh, um, high lead. Uh, you see some here, some here, some here, and the, the river runs right here. Um, so the first question we have is, up here is, is there any relationship between the features of high lead concentrations in the Flint River? And how does this impact your assignment one um, and the claims you made? And, and how do you know this? How, how would you, what would the mechanism be uh, between high lead concentrations in the Flint River? Uh, and again, we go deeper into this. Do you think proximity to the river affects the sample of lead concentration based on your maps? Why or why not? Does this affect vary depending on how you classify your data? And it, if you look at the classifications, you tell me. Is there a difference between lead and the river based on this? Then more importantly, we always have to take a critical eye about the drivers for this change. 
as to whether it's uh, it's actually occurring or not, right? We have to think about the causal mechanism for the relationship between lead exposure and the Flint River. There could be another variable that we're not accounting for. So um, those are the first two questions that we've gone through, and you should feel a little bit more comfortable maybe addressing them. Uh, I'm going to leave this to you. Why would an average lead value be dangerous here? I don't want to go through every single question. I want to leave something to you. Um, so that, that's left to you. Think about what an average does and, and what an average can, uh, how it collapses down data and, and what that might mean to those most vulnerable. Um, what, if anything, can a map tell us that other data sets cannot? Well, geographic things can tell us a lot. Uh, so add, add a couple from just your knowledge of what maps have told you in the past, even if it's just Google Maps. Um, what area of Flint are likely most vulnerable and why, if you can't tell state what information you'd like to know. So just to make sure that in case you can't use QGIS, I want you to feel comfortable looking at this. We're going to next double click on Flint data demographic data. I'm going to move down and choose graduated as well. And what we're going to do is look at the um, percent. This is demographic data from the census joined to these wards. And in my case, I'm going to look at um, percent black. And we're going to choose the color ramp. We can choose maybe because the other one is red. So maybe I want to choose a, to a nice blue or something. And apply. I regret choosing blue. Oh, I forgot to classify. That happens all the time. Apply. And so now we see this is the percentage uh, of um, black participants in the in the census. Remember, the census attempts to count everyone. It is not um, always successful. Uh, we also see we have missing data for a lot of these wards. This is a critical problem. So we can't understand, well, actually, these are low values. I think we actually have all data in the census uh, because it's actually pretty complete. So I'm going to do natural breaks and maybe not a, uh, maybe I'll do a different uh, starting color. Like, uh, it doesn't look very good, I like a light blue. I actually think these are really, well, we could play around with the categories. Also, one thing I like to do is um, I do like having a little better breaks here. These are standard deviation breaks. Um, so you can play around with these. In my case, I'm just going to choose equal interval. So, um, and I actually don't really don't like this uh, this color scale. So I'm going to choose like a like a orange to red, just because the the river is blue, and I don't want to. Okay, wow, that's really bright. Anyway, so you can play around with the colors, but really what this is showing us is that we have a high concentration of um, people who on the census identified as black in this area. Now we can look at the um, percent white. I can click apply, and the, it looks like uh, the percent white is highest in these wards, right? And it's lowest in these wards. And what I can do is I can actually flip on and off. If I click OK here, I can flip on and off to see how the um, lead sits with this. So the first thing I see, let me switch this to uh, percent black. And I see here that as I turn this on and off, that some of the wards that we, ha we have no lead data for are actually red, which means high percentage um, of black, we, we could go through and also look at all other groups and, and try to look at the distribution of places we don't have data across all of them. And I'd suggest you do that. But the first thing I see is, well, I might worry about 
the potential exposure within these wards where I have no data. So that's my first thought. Remember, we always have to collect data uh, in order to understand the extent of the problem and who's vulnerable. So I might say we should go into these wards and try to sample. Um, and the second part is that, well, now that I've looked through this, I can look at uh, potential areas of environmental justice, right? Are there areas, for example, where if I go back into here, the median income is low. So I have median income down here, percent unemployment. Right, so if I do the same thing, click apply, and then look at this value, this is the median income. Oh, let me actually uh, classify. Right, this is the median income. We have lowest incomes over here and highest income right here and the highest income is forty seven thousand dollars forty seven thousand one hundred and eighty four that's the highest uh, break there and so I see that well these areas where they all, the median income is only twenty thousand are in fact the areas uh, some of the areas where we're seeing uh, lead I also though see that one of the highest areas here also is showing lead so I think that's a really good point uh, to uh, um, to 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 look at. Um, so there's a lot of things you could look at there. So let's going back to our assignment. Um, is there any relationship with features with lead concentrations? We could look at that spatial resolution. There are a lot of holes in this sampling data shape file indicating by the white space now clear space um, in the uh, the features. We we talk about looking at um, household income. We talk about the, who we collect data on and how this can lead to areas of environmental injustice. Um, we, we look at the, the uh, racial distribution of the area. Um, and so this is a critical uh, first uh, uh, step to assess a problem. So if someone gives you a data set and they want to, to know if there's likely a problem here um, and you, you're using QGIS to do that, uh, this is a good first start. Um, at the at the issue. So uh, again, this is Kyle Monahan going through tutorial uh, three uh, in QJS just to quickly show you how you can get started uh, with QJS. Again, I just want to highlight you don't have to do this. It's not graded. This is just for your own benefit. GIS is a very powerful tool, and I want you to feel empowered to use it um, for your own uh, work and, and studies in the future. So um, thank you very much for listening, and I, I hope that was helpful.